Good morning and welcome to our latest webinar series coming to you from uh, uh, Renew and from the Western Alliance for Greenhouse. Um, yeah, happy Saturday morning. Let me just turn that off. Um, today we are going to be talking about how to uh, get through summer. I think our um, our timing for this particular webinar is excellent given we've just had a string of really hot days uh, and coming into a cooler few days this week will give us some time to get out and about and, and have a look at where we can make some improvements for the next um, hot few days. Um, as uh, My name is Kelly, uh, I'm from Melton City Council um, and Melton City Council acknowledges local Aboriginal Australians. Um, we recognise the people of the Kulin Nation as the Ab original custodians of the land, now known as the City of Melton, which is where I'm sitting today. And on behalf of um, the municipality and, and the council that I represent, um, I'd like to pay my respect, respects to their elders past and present and future. Um, Council works really hard towards traditional owner partnerships with a shared vision, knowledge and understanding and as one of the oldest continuing world cultures with strong connections to land and water, Council acknowledges that Aboriginal people have knowledge that sustained the wildlife and habitat of this country um, for thousands of years. Um, and I do like to read that off our environment plan, um, sits on the cover of our environment plan uh, because I think it's a really beautiful way of acknowledging country. Um, a few housekeeping things today. Uh, we are recording this session just so that um, we can share the information uh, in the future. Um, the chat function on the bottom of your screen uh, allows you to ask some questions. So if you have some questions as we go along, um, please type them into the chat box. And also if you've noticed that somebody else has asked a question that you would also like to know the answer to, um, please use the like button in the chat um, function so that um, it will kind of boost up that question and I'll understand that a lot of people are um, wanting to know the answer. At the end, uh, uh, we will be talking to um, our expert, I'll introduce him in a minute, for about 90 minutes um, with the understanding that probably the last half an hour will be questions and answers. So we'll go through the questions that you've asked in the chat and give you an opportunity to ask anything further. If you're having any technical assistance and you'd like tech support to help, um, please just use the raise hand function and um, we can get some help to you if you're having issues. So um, I'd like to introduce Dean Lombard. He's our expert today. Um, Dean's done a number of these series. So if you've been watching along, you'll recognize Dean's friendly face. Um, Dean's a former social worker and an energy specialist who's worked on issues such as energy efficiency, fuel choice, consumer protections, um, hardship assistance and community energy projects. He's interested in helping people and communities take control of their energy needs and make the system work for them. That's a really great introduction to you, Dean. Where are you, Dean? Um, here, I think. Am I there? We're having a few technical glitches this morning. But, uh, That's okay. I'm looking now? at three yeah. different screens. Great. So. <laughs> you know, I'm a bit the same. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks. And um, yeah, that's what we aim to do. Um, it's an aspirational goal. So let's see how we go. Uh, I would like to acknowledge um, I'm on the um, land of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people in West Footscray. Um, also, we would like to acknowledge that today is Remembrance, Remembrance Day and, you know, just remember that, you know, Remembrance Day is not celebrating war, it's remembering the enormous suffering that war has caused. So that's that's uh, something that I, I try to remember as well. Um, and I also just want to clarify just before we get started that there's a chat and a Q&A at the bottom of your screen and the Q&A is the place for questions for the Q&A session at the end of my presentation. That's questions for me to have that discussion at the end. Uh, the chat function is is probably more for, you know, any conversations, reactions between attendees as we go along. So do put your questions in the Q&A if you want them to be answered in the Q&A session at the end. My presentation goes for about 45 minutes and then we should have at least half an hour for a Q&A, which I often find is the most interesting 
part of the session. Um, I also did get the list of uh, people's interests that you put in when you um, signed up. So I'll, I'll try to address those things in my presentation. Um, but I will get started now sharing my screen. So this presentation is about, it's about, it's really about energy efficiency, but we're really focusing on summer energy efficiency issues, which is really, you know, being comfortable at home in summer, being not too hot. Um, because in the end, energy efficiency is always about how do I do the things I need to do, use, you know, and with, using energy as effectively as possible so I'm not basically wasting energy you know none of us like electricity or gas or whatever for itself we would like it for the things that we do um and so with that sort of in mind like that's why I, the stuff I cover in this session is a bit of basic stuff about energy usage how we use energy in the homes in our home and then a lot about the house itself because the house is like your biggest appliance you know if the house a house can keep you cool in summer and warm in winter without needing much or any appliances to do so. And, and that's as, as the better we can get our houses, the more electricity we can save in keeping our temperature in a comfortable zone. Then I'll talk a bit about sort of cooling appliances. And if there's time at the end, I'll go into a couple of other more general energy efficiency stuff because it's all, you know, it's energy efficiency is more than just heating and cooling. Uh, but I might skim through that if you run out of time a bit because the, the heating and cooling stuff is really the big bucks and in summer it's all about cooling or keeping cool so energy usage in the home um and this is general energy usage and this pie chart here is a, is an australian average and sort of melbourne's sort of about average in australia in terms of how much we use for different stuff um, and you'll see that heating and cooling is nearly half of energy usage in a typical home. Uh, that's the main thing that we use energy for. We use more heating in cooler climates and Victoria is actually, most of Victoria is a cooler climate. We do a lot more heating than cooling. Uh, in, in more Northern areas of Australia, there's a lot more cooling than heating, but the energy usage comes out to approximately the same. And the second biggest is water heating, uh, which we often don't think about. We just turn on a tap and there's a hot water, but a lot of energy goes into that water. And then, you know, refrigeration is quite a big one. Um, lighting is probably smaller than it is shown in this chart because lighting has become more efficient in the last few years. Um, look, and everything else is pretty much small bananas. Um, this is just average or typical. It can vary enormously depending on what sort of appliances you have. If you have really efficient heating and cooling, you'll use less for that. Um, if you have a pool, you have a whole other big wedge jamming all these aside because pool pumps take enormous amounts of energy. Um, if you do welding or, you know, have an electric kiln, um, again, a lot more. So it's just, just an average. Um, but good to keep in mind that the different sorts of things that we use. Um, and look, I always tell people like, you know, it's good to get a handle on your bill to say you understand. You can look at your bill and read, you know, what's my usage and who's my retailer and all that sort of stuff. And I do think the most interesting stuff on the bill is the stuff down here like this one shows you your usage over each billing period. And this example is quarterly bills. I think it's like a South Australian or Queensland bill, but in Victoria, most of our bills are monthly. And it's really useful to look at the amount that we use each month because you see how it changes at different times of year. And like in this example, you know, this this is um most, there's more electricity being used in the May, the, the, the May quarter than, than the um, sort of the November, August, which shows that I guess a bit, probably a bit more for cool, for heating, but still a fair bit for cooling. Um, in really cold places, you'll see summer usage quite low, and you might see winter usage quite high in the opposite in hot places. The other useful bit is this thing uh, that shows you how many people in your household and how much um, how much kilowatt hours per day that that equates to. Um, because your kilowatt usage per day is on the bill here. Um, here it's like um, 13.7. It doesn't matter if you don't really understand what a kilowatt hour is. It's just a unit that we measure electricity usage in. So that shows your average per day. And that's a good benchmark to compare against other people or other households or also to use to compare different costs of energy. And this chart here sort of shows um, average house, average usage in households in your area 
depending on how many people in the household. So you can see here that a one person household in your area um, uses 10.4 kilowatt hours a day and a two person household uses 14.6. So this usage here is right in the middle of that. So if this was a one or two person household, you go, oh yeah, that's sort of average-ish. But if you were like a four or five person household, you'd be going, wow, we're really efficient. So that's that's how this is useful. You can see, you know, where are this many people household? How does our usage compare against other houses of similar sizes? And that gives you an indication of whether you've got a lot to gain by improving energy efficiency or whether you haven't got that much, frankly. Um, and yeah, the Energy Made Easy website, uh, which is just Energy Made Easy um, gov.au, has this really great tool where you can compare your household usage to other similar households like yours. And, and again, it's just a good way to, um, to to find out, you know, am I using energy averagely efficiently or am I much more efficient or am I much less efficient? Um, so it's, good, it's a good way to let you know, have I got a lot to gain by looking at a lot of energy efficiency? The other useful thing to do is Victoria Energy Compare um, website, um, which actually lets you compare your bill against other energy offers um energy prices vary enormously and it just depends on what price that the companies decide to sell it at um there's obviously lots of factors that go into how they set the prices but um recent analysis done by san vincent de paul has found that you know you could save five six seven hundred dollars a year if you were on one of the more expensive offers and moved to one of the more cheap ones so there's this huge variation in prices prices and that that website is really useful and it's got a good feature now where you can actually authorize it to grab your data from your smart electricity meter to actually compare your actual usage over the last year and try that against different offers. And that can give you a pretty good, um, pretty good indication of what you might be able to save by changing retailers. Anyway, that's sort of the basic stuff on energy usage, energy costs. If you, you know, know how well your energy compares to similar households, and if you've got yourself on a good energy deal then you're sort of well set to make the most benefit out of improving your efficiency um, and improving your comfort, which is really the aim of it. More comfort for less cost. So I said before, the house is the biggest appliance that you have, uh, and it is really important. And if you've lived in lots of different houses, you've probably noticed that some are much more able to sort of stay cool or warmer than others. And it depends on all sorts of details about how they're made um, and what's in them. The important principle here is that you know, sort of scientifically, heat, like there's no such thing as sort of cold. Cold is the lack of heat. Heat moves to anything that's colder than it. That's the basic physics principle of how heat works. Um, so if your house is cooler inside than outside, then the hot air outside tries to get into your house because it wants to go somewhere cooler. It doesn't actually want to. It's just, you know, anthropomorphizing a bit and it's the same in, it's the same in winter you know in winter you're trying to keep your house warm and that warm air is trying to get out to where it's colder because that's what heat does so the big aim with your house performance is to stop that heat being able to move as much as possible uh, and this shows like heat gain from different parts of your home windows is a big one uh, and the roof is a big one as well um you know walls are also significant um gaps and that let air flow between inside and outside can be responsible for quite a lot depending on how many there are um w windows are actually the most important one because w the air, hot air moves more easily through windows because they tend to transmit heat but also sun on windows magnifies heat so even though it's on this picture windows look about the same as roof remember the roof covers your whole house and windows only cover really relatively small bits so Per like square meter, windows let more heat in than anything. Um, so you know if you so ceiling insulation, absolutely really great bang for buck, and window treatment, they're the two biggest ones that will change how hot your house gets. Um, like if you own your house and it's, the ceiling's not fully insulated, it's so it's relatively cheap to install, and um, you know you, you pay it pays back in a year, a couple of years by your savings and cooling and you know you also much more comfort so that's a bit of a no-brainer uh, if you can do it it's a bit harder if you're a renter unfortunately um but yeah we really like to look at windows and ceiling insulation as the biggest things both for heating and for cooling um 
without going into the technicalities of NATA's star ratings and all that, this is just the systems for rating the thermal performance of houses. This just shows, as an example, how the change in energy needed to keep a house at a comfortable temperature, depending on how well a house is insulated. Like six star is the sort of current standard we've had for like the last 10 years or so. Seven star is the new standard. These are standards for new build houses. Three star is like sort of average for houses that are more than 20 years old. So chances are your house is three star, unless you're in a fairly new house. Uh, you can see here like a three star house that needs like two and a half to three times the energy to keep at a comfortable temperature than a modern house made to the current standard of thermal insulation. And plenty of people are saying the current standard is not high enough anyway, but you can, there's still a huge difference. So this is, you know, getting this down is really important. So that's what we're trying to do when we're looking at our house thermal performance. And one way that you can get it, if you really want to take it seriously, there's this thing called the residential efficiency scorecard where um, the qualified assessor comes to your house and looks around, looks at your appliances, talks to you about how you live and how you use your appliances and assesses the performance of your house um, and sort of gives you gives you this um, this little che checklist uh, of, you know, here's how your house rates for heating and cooling and other stuff. And they'll also give you suggestions as to what to do to improve it. That's a really good scheme. And currently um, there's like government discounts for getting one of these assessors out to your house. So the prices vary a lot, but it's worth looking up, looking into, especially, I guess, especially if you own a place and you're feeling like you want to spend some money to make it perform better, but you're not quite sure where to start because these assessors will really, really help you identify what's the biggest thing I can do to make the biggest difference. I had one come to my rental house a couple of years ago when it was free for renters um, and you know that as a renter i had much less options than a homeowner would have but the assessor still found some stuff that i could do myself that really made a difference so i do recommend it if you're going to be in a house for a while and you know you you especially if you own it and you've got a little bit of money to spend to improve it and yeah i sort of said you know ceiling insulation biggest bang for buck check that it's in, in that your ceiling's insulated see if it needs to be upgraded you might need to get an expert to look at that to see that, but it's a lot of houses have partial insulation. Sometimes if you've had work done, they remove insulation and don't put it back. That's what was the case in the rental house I had examined a few years ago. And uh, it was really easy to put insulation back that had been moved by an electrician and made a big difference. Um, and yeah, still insulation has this R rating and R5 is what's considered pretty good for ceilings um, and R2.5 for walls. Um, you do get more performance if you go higher than the R rating, but you sort of get diminishing returns um r5 is pretty good um and since ceiling insulation is very effective floor insulation wall insulation not so easy to do to an existing home because it's a lot more like it's easy for most places to do ceiling insulation unless you've got sort of flat roofs um wall and floor can be much more difficult to retrofit you'd obviously do it when you're building but some places it's more easy than others and there's different types of insulation that can help with retrofits such as blowing insulation that goes inside walls or if you've got a big gap under your house it can might be easier to put the floor insulation is but ceiling is the best bang for buck if you had to choose i would tell you do ceiling the others uh you know you get a bit less benefit from they still some benefit and there's also more options like for walls you can grow plants to cover to shade the walls and stuff like that one thing about ceiling insulation that's important to know is that it, it, it is legal to do it yourself but there are some serious safety issues, which you might remember from about 10 years ago when we had that federal government insulation scheme. Uh, you do need to know what you're doing. Uh, so we wouldn't really recommend doing it yourself unless you really know what you're doing, uh, have experience or working with someone who has. Um, but yeah, um, if you get people to do it, it's still pretty cost effective because the industry has grown quite a bit because of new standards um, and new awareness about insulation uh sustainability victoria has a great um piece of great great page of information for people who are thinking of installing ceiling insulation themselves around the safety issues um, you can probably google it if you can't write that down um if you're a renter you know renters probably can't really do I mean, it's it's slightly gray because tenants are now able to do some minor modifications I, I don't think that insulation would be classed as that, especially because it's got safety issues. And I would be concerned about, you know, any liability a tenant might have if they 
in trade installing their own insulation and they get something wrong and cause some damage. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know, but I would just be worried about it. Um, again, um, I would, if you're a renter, I would talk to your landlord and see, see um, what you can come to. Um, and some landlords are quite responsive to this stuff. Others are not. Some tenants don't like to ask their landlords because, you know, they're worried that they might get evicted or, you know, that they might get their rent put up. So that's, you know, that you got to work out what you're comfortable with. So that's ceilings. Um, I'm going to do a bit on windows because windows are a lot easier to do even yourself and also a lot more you can do for a renter. I use this picture of a thermal image camera, which basically um, measures heat. Uh, and this is actually a winter one that shows heat from inside the house escaping through the windows. But I, I use it because it's still a good example to show how much heat travels through windows. And also you can see doors, right? The, the red bit basically is hot and the green bit and blue is cold. So you can see the heat just, you know, in this case, racing out those windows, shooting out the garage door, the front door and everything. And in summer, it's pretty much the same except the heat going in. Um, so window coverings and external shading are the simple and effective ways to do that in winter. Wi internal window coverings work the best because they stop the heat from getting to the glass. The glass is what actually transfers the heat. Uh, in summer, external shading is better for the same reason. It stops the heat from hitting the glass. The glass is the heat hitting the glass is what makes the transfer happen. So if you can stop the hot bits from hitting the glass, uh, that you improve performance. Um, and look, this is a chart I came across. Um, I'm actually not sure of the data behind it um, about heat gain through windows, depending on the type of window and how they're treated. Um, you know, a single glazed window, this is a regular window, one pane of glass, no, no blind on the outside, no curtain on the inside. Um, its heat gain is the same as running like a single bar electric radiator, like nearly 800 watts. That's a lot. Um, double glazing cuts it down a fair bit. But interestingly, double glazing is actually not as effective for keeping heat out um, as it is for keeping heat in during winter. But still fairly effective. It cuts it down to 600. Heavy, well-fitted drapes actually perform better than double glazing for keeping heat out. Um, a bit less effective for keeping heat in, but pretty close. You can get solar film that you stick on your windows. You can buy this at Bunnings now. I, I saw it at Bunnings. It keeps out like the heat light to stop heat get, coming in. Very effective. Shading from stuff outside the window helps even more. And full shading with like a pergola or shade cloth. Look, it's a, it's a quarter, lets a quarter of the heat in as a, an unprotected window. So that's a huge difference. And of course, if you have a few of these, Techniques like, you know, the shading and some solar film and some drapes, you actually stack the benefits. So window treatment can have a huge impact. And external shading is a thing for summer. And the principle of a lot of shading is that, you know, in summer, the sun is high. In winter, it's lower. Because in winter, you actually want sun in windows. It helps warm the house. So some of the best shading solutions are either removable, so you can put them down in summer and remove them in winter, or they're designed in such a way to let the sun in, to let the lower sun in winter, but to keep the higher sun out in the summer. Um, and yeah, any sort of permanent shaving like verandas or eaves really should be designed so that they let the sun in in winter. Um, but there are plenty of these temporary sort of solutions, uh, much more doable for sort of renters because they don't necessarily involve making any physical changes to the home, like working out how to hang up shade cloth or tarpaulins or bamboo screens and stuff like this. But if you can stop the sun hitting the windows, uh, you stop a lot of the heat. And some classic ways of external shading, yeah, are eaves, trees, pergolas, shade cloth, um, shades and external blinds. The external blinds are particularly good. This picture shows the whole thing about, you know, the high sun. This, this, this is a tree, right? A tree in summer, it shades this window. But in winter, there's no leaves on the tree because it's a deciduous tree and the sun can shine right through into the house. That's that's sort of what you want. And similar with um, this one has a pergola with like slats and the slats are angled so that in summer, when the sun's higher, it doesn't go through the slats, but it sort of stops there and it shades the area. But in winter, 
the, because the angle is slats, so the sun can shine through the angles and can go in. So that's some examples of the stuff you can do if you own a place and you can put up, you know, plant trees and put up pergolas and stuff. Um, one consideration with window shading is, you know, in summer, the hotter sun is in the middle of the day, but we still get a lot of hot sun, especially in the afternoons, but also in the mornings and the sun moves around the sky. So, um, if you're on north facing windows, you actually need to overhang any shade the same distance to the side as you go across the top. And that's to stop the sun coming in earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon. And all these diagrams and way more information on this. Uh, is on the yourhome.gov.au website. This is a fantastic resource with heaps of stuff for home energy efficiency and thermal performance. Uh, it's mainly, it's really aimed at people who own a house or are building a house, but a lot of the information is also useful for renters. So it's about the principles of how you, you know, do stuff. And here's some examples of external shading. Um, like, you know, this is like a shade cloth sort of thing and you can have them sort of permanently fixed, but you can also rig these up temporarily um if you need to and like you know it's often doable for a rental home if you've got places you can tie them or fix them um, under eaves or something another technique uh very renter friendly is to use bulldog clips to attach it to the guttering um you just need to make sure it's not in a place where it gets lots of wind load because the guttering is not the most strongest part of the house this is a uh, one of those sort of fancy sort of built solutions with um E, uh, not eaves like um slats and some of these are fixed in position to let the summer sun in and to let's keep the summer sun out and let the winter sun in others are sort of operable so you can open and close them uh and look these old school external blinds these are fantastic i the last place i rented had these on um, the western windows and they made such a difference so they're, they're really worth you know if you've got them keep them um if you're, you know, thinking of putting something on your home, these are not a bad consideration. You do, you do lose um, some light, of course, and that's the the advantage of these slat pergola things and even shade classes that you still get some light through. But um, they are very effective for keeping the sun out. Now, internal drapes also work pretty well, and you know, if you can't put external drapes on, they're like the next best thing um if you do have external blinds uh they they still help a bit more because there's actually two things remember with heat gain in summer in through windows and one is the, the sun directly hitting the window and you know it's like a magnifying glass sort of to heat it up um that's what external blinds are really good for but the other thing is just the hot air on the outside of the window even if it doesn't have direct sun the hot air touches the window the inside of the house is cooler it'll travel through the glass um, and make the inside of the house hotter. So that those two things both happen and the internal drapes are really good for stopping that heat transfer through the glass. Uh, curtains or honeycomb or cellular blinds that fit inside the window frame. Um, double, double glazing does help with the heat transfer thing. Very expensive to retrofit. If you're building, they're a no-brainer really. You can also buy um sort of perspex panes or films that you attach to the inside of the window to sort of make it like double glazing with the air gap because it's the air gap that makes a difference um but yeah it's still a fair bit of you know still a bit of cost and a bit of work but they can be quite effective and they help because you can keep the light through the window and the view if you've got the view but um yeah drapes really work well uh and also think about gaps around windows gaps are gaps are one of the places where air gets in and we'll do that temperature change thing and windows is a it, there's often lots of gaps around windows because where the panes join together, you get gaps, especially with like old fashioned sash windows that go up and down and you can put felt between them to seal the gap. Uh, there's often gaps around the frames as well. Um, aluminium window frames let a lot of heat in even without gaps because the aluminium transfers heat even better than glass. Uh, that's why modern windows that are aluminium, the good quality ones, have what they call thermally broken aluminium frames where there's got a plastic material in between the inside and the outside aluminium so that the heat doesn't transfer uh, there's not much you can do about that if you've got them apart from keep the shade off them if you can but, but windows really do you know it's about you know 30 to 40 percent of heat gain in your house will be through the windows in the end um with internal drapes palmets are really useful they're they're pretty most effective for again in winter to keep heat in because in winter there's this circulation thing that happens with the warm air in the in the in the room circulates behind the drapes and 
and you get sucked out through the window. But in summer, they work fairly well as well because hot air, you know, heat comes through the window and makes hot air in between the window and the curtain. And then the heat rises, so it shoots up the top into the room and some sort of bleaches down into the room as well. But it's, it's more through the hot. It is really like a little hot air vent. Um, if you have a palmet, and you can see the diagram here, the little cover over the window, over the curtain, it just sort of stops that hot air going up there. You'll still get a bit around the bottom of the sides, but you get a lot less. And you can actually do palmets that, you know, go down the sides and even the bottom as well, optimally. Um, that stops the most. But, you know, a palmet at the top is usually pretty effective because it mostly does shoot up the top. Um, and if you've got heavy grapes and drapes and they cover right to the end of the frames, so like not just the window, but beyond and below, you do manage to keep a lot of the heat just sort of stuck in between the window and the glass and keeps it a bit from getting too much into the room. Here are just some examples of helmets. You know, you can install them and, you know, whatever your decor is, you can figure out ways to match it. There are lots of ways to do helmets. Um, if you're a renter, um, you can still do sort of improvised helmets, like a bit of cardboard. I keep on forgetting to fix that typo. <laughs> a bit of cardboard or core flute across the top. You can sort of, you know, blue tack it or masking tape it to the top of the window frame and then, you know, attach it to the top of the curtain rail. That can be quite effective. Um, yeah, so they, they really do work. I've had them in my house before. Um, you know, if the house doesn't have very good curtains, uh, you could usually find decent curtains at op shops, garage sales, et cetera um and replace the curtains and you can always change them back when you move out and they work a lot because you know really thin curtains don't do anything but thick curtains do insulate both in winter and in summer and you can buy special thermal curtains that are particularly designed to stop heat transfer they work the best but even regular curtains that are just sort of thick will will help a lot bubble wrap is another one uh and again this is more a winter thing keeping heat out it's they often call it renters double glazing um because it has it works on the same principle where you know it traps air between the window glass and the inside of the room to and that air helps to stop the heat transferring um i've this is a photo of my room um i, I tried this because i used to get a cold draft off this window so i tried the bubble wrap in winter and it made a huge difference even though i've got sort of heavy drapes and made a big difference because I've got aluminium frames, a lot of heat transfer, and it's very drafty. It's an old house. But I've found that the bubble wrap also helps in summer. Again, a bit less effective than in winter, but it still does help some of that heat transfer because, again, it's a bit like double glazing. So, And as you can see, it doesn't look too terrible, I don't think. You know, this is a window where my view is not that great. It's just like frosted glass. Um, I, I, find it, I find it works quite well. Um, and. This again, this diagrams from winter because so much of the energy efficiency stuff we do is around keeping heat in, but the principles are mostly the same. This this just shows all areas where cold drafts get in or hot air escapes your house in winter. And in summer, a lot of it just goes back the other way. Like, you know, the air vents, uh, gaps around the windows, gaps in the floors, chimneys, probably mainly a winter thing, but um, gaps where anything goes through the wall. Just you get that hot air able to come through every little bit Every bit's a little bit, but it all adds up and can make a lot more heat transfer. So the more of these gaps you can find and sort of block up, the easier it is to keep the hot air out of your house. The wall vents, um, if you have gas or wood appliances in the house, you must you have to leave those wall vents open because they are designed to uh, let carbon carbon monoxide build up out of the house from using like gas stove or you know wood 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 heater or something um you know if they're blocked up you can actually you know be poisoned by carbon monoxide uh but if you've got no gas appliances in the home at all and you've got no wood heating or anything then it's it's okay to cover up those vents with a bit of cardboard or core fluid or something um and they're often recommended in winter because a lot of hot air goes out and it's probably a bit less of an issue in summer but i think the gaps around the windows and doors is a real big one for summer and skylights as well actually let a lot of heating they, they can be hard to deal with um you can you can do a bit of quite a bit of draft proofing yourself you can use gap sealer or soft foam in in gaps and some old homes have huge gaps especially look under cupboards and that i've got some in my house where there's a built-in cupboard that just has a hole right through to the inside of the wall and it's quite a thick hole like about you know a centimeter thick and i just stuffed it full of soft foam from sort of packaging material and worked really well so there's a lot of stuff you can do door snakes um 
flaws sometimes flaws can be be cooling in summer it depends uh if you feel like you, if you feel like you've got a lot of heat coming through your floors then rugs are great um if you feel like you get a bit of a cooling draft then maybe keep them there depends a bit really uh depends on the day as well rugs on timber floors are particularly good in winter another important thing in summer is you can actually manage a bit of ventilation manually and you know you have that thing where often it's hotter than, than inside during the day but then it often can cool down in the evening and end up being cooler outside than in the house and that's a good time to like open doors open windows and um let the cool air in so if you work out how to get airflow through your house in those cool summer evenings is a really good way to help cool the house down and basically the cooler you can get the house overnight, then the longer it takes to heat up the next day. The worst summer experience is when the house just gets hotter and hotter and hotter each day. And that tends to happen on heat waves, especially when it's not cool overnight. So anything you can do to cool down the house overnight really does help. On the draft stopping thing, um, people often ask, oh, is it, should I block every little hole? Can you, is it, or do you need to keep some ventilation? And you know, how much is too far? And there is a bit of a sweet spot. You do need to keep some ventilation. Um, you know, if it's if it's if you've got heaps of draft spots, you just hide in summer, cold in winter. You get drafts, you get insects. Uh, if you've got super tight, no gaps, you can get some mold and condensation, and you know, carbon dioxide build up and stuff. There is a sort of sweet spot where there's a bit of ventilation, but you're not letting too much air in and out, and there's enough. You know, the air changes happen, but not too much. Um, and, you know, for an existing home, it's, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to actually block up enough fence to make it like this where it's actually not working well. In new homes, you've got to be careful. And some some new homes have, you know, ventilation systems in order to have more tightness from outside air. But um, if you're burning gas or wood, you need to do a bit more to make sure you've got enough ventilation. And, you know, those high air vents, they're actually not too bad when you need that ventilation because sure they let hot air in and out, but uh, also you don't feel drafts from hot, hot um from high vents the same way you do from like under doors and stuff. So um, yeah, that's a good way to go. And look, a good way to find drafts you can easily find drafts, especially in winter. Actually, is the easiest way is just walk around the house barefoot you'll feel where the air cold air comes in. That's a good way to identify them and then blocking up those leakage points will benefit you in winter and in summer. Uh, another thing that people do is sort of walk around with a candle or with an incense stick and just watch where the smoke blows. That will point you towards drafty areas. I've got this one thing about thermal mass and it's impossible to get a photo of thermal mass apart from to show this, this is the only one I could find. Uh, thermal mass is basically brick and concrete holds heat um this is good to know because you know you might have a big solid concrete driveway or a brick wall on the north side it'll store the heat and then it's and it follows that same principle you know once it gets colder then once the air gets colder then the wall will start releasing the heat so this is actually really good in winter because you can capture some sunlight and then it'll help to keep the house warm um and some people even design homes to have an internal brick wall so that sun shines on it during the day in winter and then it's like a bit of a heat bank for overnight but in summer this is a problem because um <laughs> the last thing you want in summer is a massive big heat bank on the side of your house in the middle of your house so just there's not much you can do about it if you've, your house is already built um if you're building a house you know think about being able to shade any thermal any thermal mat uh if you've got a house look it's helpful to identify if you've got thermal mass concrete slabs that the sun hits brick walls so you can go okay how can I shade that um, and that'll give you a big benefit um, if you've ever lived in a big double brick house like I used to you you'll find that you get this weird double double thing happening in the summer where for the first few days of a heat wave the house is really cool because the bricks are soaking up all the heat and it takes a while for it to come through but then after a few days you start getting the heat through inside the house and then the house is hot for a month and then the house is and that's not a good experience so yeah if you can shade thermal mass that's really helpful i'm going to move on to cooling appliances because you know we do as much as we can with our house but in the end we might have to do some cooling and cooling can work well with even with good performing houses because you know days and days of heat can make a house heat up quite a bit and if your house is well insulated then cooling will be very effective and be much more economical to run 
Um, the first thing you should do if you're buying a cooling appliance, you know, get a new one. This is a really old one. That's not efficient. Um, there are sort of four main types of cooling, um, sort of three actually, but you know, we're all familiar with the split system. It's the most, it's a, you know, they're everywhere nowadays. They're used for heating as well. Uh, most of them, they're called reverse cycle. If they're called reverse cycle, um, they heat as well. And then these are usually called reverse cycle air conditioners um, or heat pumps in other parts of the world. Um, yeah, they're actually the most efficient form of heating as well, but then they're pretty efficient form of cooling. Uh, and they're pretty common. And a lot of us have them in our homes. They use a heat pump technology to provide cool air. It's the same way that a fridge works. It basically is about grabbing the heat and moving it to another place, pretty much. And they're very efficient. Uh, you know, you get, you know, three to five times as much heat energy removed for every unit of any electricity that you put into them. Uh, because the way the heat pump works, it actually uses ambient heat in the air to make them work. So these are very effective. Um, they particularly work well if your home is well insulated because they, you know, they run off a thermostat and they switch off and on. And if your house is well insulated, it'll just run for a bit and it'll go off. Um, if your house is not well insulated, it'll run constantly and cost you a lot more. There's all these box air cons that you're probably familiar with. And these are the older style and often they stick out of windows. Uh, they're basically the same technology as these. And a lot of them are reverse cycle too. They will also heat. They're cheaper to buy than the split systems. You can DIY install them often if you've got a few handyman sort of skills. Uh, but keep in mind, though, that they are often a source of drafts because if you stick them in a window, it's very hard to seal properly around them. And even the ones that are stuck into walls, often you get drafts through them. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, they are much less efficient than split systems just because of their design. Because of the all-in-one design, they can't get the same efficiency. But, you know, they still do work fairly well. And look, if you've got a really old one, they probably cost a fortune to run. The new ones are more efficient than the older ones. Um, they are a cheaper option. Um, they're still not as cheap to run as these split systems. So that's worth keeping in mind. But, you know, if you've got them and you need some cooling, they're a pretty good way to do it. A lot of houses have this evaporative cooling, which is distinctive by the box on the roof. This uses a whole different technique to make cool air. It pulls the hot air through wet pads and then circulates it through ducts in the house usually. They actually use a lot less electricity than these things because they're just running a fan. Um, but they use heaps of water and you can see there's a water pipe going up to it. Um, they take 10 to 20 litres per hour. So the cost of water, um, look, you'd have to do the math, but you know that it adds a lot to the cost. It, it offsets the saving electricity, but they're using a lot of water as well. Um, and like if the ducts are in poor condition, this is the issue with all ducted heating, um, that cost even more to run because you lose a lot of the cool air inside the roof space if the ducts like have holes in them and they've been eaten by rats and stuff like that. Um, you also need to have some open windows because these require some air circulation with the outside to work properly. Um, and look, also, they work way better when it's dry heat than when it's a humid heat, um, which I think was one reason that they have been popular in Victoria because we have less humid heat than, say, further north. But um, but things are actually getting more humid um, in our climate because of the changing climate. We get more humidity now than we used to. So they do become less effective when you've got high humidity because of the moisture in the air. They also can't provide heating. So, you know, if you're thinking about between this and that for a house that you're building or a house that you own that doesn't have heating and cooling um, or that you want to upgrade, these are pretty good because you get one appliance install cost and you use it for a heater and for a cooler. These just cool to keep in mind. And then there's the humble fan, you know, which I've got one running in my room right now. <laughs> so I don't really have much cooling in this house. Um, these work pretty well. They just blow air around the room. They don't make it colder, but a breeze on our skin makes us feel colder. That's why when you look at the weather report, it's got the actual temperature and the feels like temperature because the feels like temperature really just considers the air movement sort of factor. So these are very effective, um, especially if you don't have anything else. And it's really about, you know, cooling yourself rather than the whole room. Um, ceiling fans work pretty well and for the whole room because they circulate air through the room and help to even out the temperature. And it can also make a bit of a breeze. So if you've got ceiling fans, try using them. They're also effective in winter because they have a setting that helps to circulate the heat better. There's also these portable ones and they're either 
you know, refrigerative, like a re heat pump or evaporative that need water. So in that sense, they work similarly to those installed ones. Um, they're cheap to buy. They're less efficient. You need space to put them. They're noisy. They do work okay. Um, so if you've got no other options, and especially if you're a renter, these might be the option for you. Um, they do work pretty well, but they don't really compare to the built-in ones, but you need to work with what you've got. If you buy a reverse cycle air conditioner, you just need to, you know, use a reputable installer who knows what they're doing because I've seen some pretty chunky installs and some really good installs. So get recommendations from people. Um, and yeah, make sure you size it right for the room because it's about the room. And, you know, if you're using it for heating and cooling, you might have a few through the house, a big one in the living room and a smaller one, say where the bedrooms are. Um, and if your house is well insulated, just a few will actually keep temperature well because the temperature equalizes within the house. An uninsulated house um, it doesn't have that same effect. Um, and yeah, you know, look for how, if you're buying one, look for how it look for the efficiency rating. It's usually cost effective to spend a bit more on a more efficient one because it uses less electricity over the life. Um, the general sort of cooling tips are similar to the heating tips. Like, you know, cool the rooms that you're using. Though if you're using ducted, you need to sort of let the air circulate through the house. And, you know, if evaporative, you need some open windows. Um, but otherwise, keep them closed because, you you know, whether you're cooling or heating, keeping the windows closed helps to keep that air transfer from happening so much. Make sure the thermostat is not in a spot where it gets direct heat or whether it, where it gets a draft in winter if they've got if you've got a thermostat on your cooling system because it will change how it works um yeah and another big plug for the ceiling fans they work really well you can also and this is especially helpful say if you're renting or you don't have money to upgrade your home and if your home's not well insulated you know if you can't heat the room or cool the room in this case because uh, the principle is the same for heating and for cooling. If you can't treat the temperature in the room, treat the temperature on yourself because in the end, it's you who needs to keep cool in summer or warm in winter. So yeah, small fans can work really well. Spray bottles with water can really help. Damp tea towel on your head or around your neck. You can use a cold water bottle. It's like a hot water bottle, but it's filled with icy water. That also helps because um, it does works the same way. So transfer of heat uh, from the hot thing to the cold thing. Um, and yeah, keep an eye on the indoor and outdoor temperatures because as soon as the temperature outside is cooler than inside, you want to open up the windows and doors so that the hot air inside your house goes to the cool place, which is now outside. Um, if you can do it overnight, that's fantastic. Depends on your security and if you've got insect screens, maybe. Um, it doesn't work if it stays. You know, we have a few days in summer often where it stays really hot overnight. That's when this doesn't work. But most of the time, it does cool down at a point and that really makes a big difference just because of that heat movement thing. Um, look, that's the main thing for cooling. And I'm sure there's a few things I forgot to mention or that I didn't make clear. So do whack them in the Q and A so that um, you can, uh, I can get the questions. I can discuss them in the Q and A session. Um, I'm going to touch on a few other energy efficiency things just because, you know, energy efficiency, although heating and cooling is, is like the main game, there's other areas as well. Um, hot water is really a thing if you um, if you own a house, it's about the appliances, and if you rent, it's also about the it's it's, it's about the usage as well. If if you own a house, it's about both. Um, we sometimes forget that hot water is a user of energy as well as water. Uh, and there was a big thing during the drought of water saving shower heads in order to save water because showers use a lot of water. Um, and a water saving shower head saves a heap. Um, but the water saving shower head also reduces your energy bills because you're using less hot water. So you need less hot water to heat it up because heating water is a bit like heating your house. When the temperature of the water drops, the heater kicks back in and heats it up again. If you're using less of the water, the water stays hot longer and you don't need to heat it up so much. You know, cut a minute off your shower every day can save 20 to 50 bucks a year on energy and more and more again on the water um and the aerators on taps which are the little things that you screw onto the end that make it sort of go instead of um they're similar to a water saving shower head they give you they're designed 
the same way. They give you the same force because often you want the force or pressure of water in a shower. You want, it, you want a bit of pressure to get through your hair and that. Um, in a tap, you might want to, you know, jet, you know, you want enough pressure to like wash stuff off plates and stuff like that or fill the sink quickly. Um, the aerator uses less water but gives you the pressure. So it'll take longer to fill your sink, but you can use you can still use it for quickly rinsing stuff in the same way, but by using less water. So if you've, if unless you've got really old taps, like all sort of modern taps made in the last 20 or 30 years, you should have little screws to attach aerators to. You can buy them from Bunnings for, you know, pretty cheap, five bucks or something, five or 10 bucks um, worth. There are different types. Some have an inside thread, some have an outside thread. So make sure what your taps got before you buy them. The other thing is insulating hot water pipes because, and this is especially a thing in winter when it's cold outside, um, but also, but still in summer, because when you think of how hot your hot water is, 50 degrees maybe, that's usually hotter than even a hot day. So you will still lose heat from your hot water to the outside, even when it's a hot day. Um, and look, the law is, the rule, for, you know, the building code for decades has been Hot water pipes need to be insulated, but you'd be surprised how many are not, especially in older homes that maybe were made before that rule came in. But even newer homes uh, can be a bit here and there. Um, and it would be quite a job to you know go insulate pipes inside the walls. But if you've got exposed hot water pipes, especially if you've got like an outside hot water system or something, um, you can buy this insulation from Bunnings again. It's very simple to put on. It's just like a sausage with a hole in it. It's like a pool noodle, but it's got a slit down the side. You can sort of see in the picture. Uh, it's really easy to put on. I put it on the pipes in my last house because I had the, the hot water system was on the other side of the backyard and it was all these exposed, uninsulated pipes and it worked a treat. I, I noticed this change in my bill by insulating the pipes um, and also it meant that, you know, I didn't have to wait so long when I turned the hot water on. So it saves water, saves energy. Um, if you are thinking about buying a hot water system, if you're wanting to replace one or you're building a new house, uh, it's worth considering an electric heat pump. Uh, they use a lot less electricity um, than traditional electric hot water systems. Uh, they use less energy than gas because of the heat pump technology and the cost per litre of hot water the cost per amount of hot water ends up being cheaper with a heat pump. They're a bit more expensive to install. Um, so cost-wise, it's probably about even over the life of the appliance with a gas hot water system, but you'll use less electricity. You'll, you'll save money on bills for the whole time. You'll also save emissions in the long run because uh, within a couple of years, emissions of the Victorian electricity sector will be probably similar or lower than gas emissions of the gas system and then you'll save emissions by using um electric instead of gas which is why there's been this bit of a push for electrifying homes um and heat pump hot water systems they come either in two parts like like your air conditioner with the box outside the separate box and the separate tank or they can be integrated there's co pros and cons for each one um again if you know if you buy one of these it's like buying a gas hot water system make sure it's the right uh, size for your household in liters of hot water that it stores um and you know if your hot water system dies you need to get one straight away and it's often really hard to then choose the one that you want and it's often hard to get heat pumps at short notice because the industry is still small in victoria so um if your hot water system does die and you want to get a heat pump you might have to wait a couple of weeks which nobody wants to do when they've got no hot water so be prepared know what you want to get find out where you can get it from if your hot water system's old um or you know replace it before it fails you know if it's 20 years old you know it's going to fail at some point in the next five or is likely to fail in the next five to ten years uh, that could be a good time to change it there are some that last a long time and some that don't um i'll just skim over the other stuff without going into too much detail um for saving en energy lighting is much less an issue with energy usage in the home now than it used to be because the modern globes and most people have either compact fluoros or LEDs use so much less electricity than the old incandescent globes. Some of us still have halogen globes, especially if you've got those little downlights, they actually use quite a lot of energy and it's good to replace them with LEDs and you can get, uh, I think, discounts through the Victorian government um, energy efficiency scheme to get them replaced with LEDs. Um, LEDs come in different types of um, color temperature 
Uh, they're cheaper and more reliable than they used to be. They're a bit of a no-brainer, really. You'll they'll save you a lot of money. Uh, they also, if you get the right LED downlights, you can cover them by insulation, which makes a big difference because halogen downlights can't be covered by insulation because of a fire risk. So they leave all these holes in the insulation, which means you lose more heat in winter and get more heat in summer. So worth thinking about if you've got halogen lights. And, you know, I do this little calculation once for one light in your house and like, you know, how much does it cost to run for the year? You know, it's $20 for an incandescent globe. And then you got to buy a new one every year because they only last that long. Um, LED costs you like $3.50, $3.60 a year. And they should last for, well, it's supposed to last for 30 years. I don't know yet, but might have lasted quite a while. So you, you can save a lot of money, even if the LEDs cost a bit more to buy, um, they can save a lot of money on uh, over, over time. And that's probably the end of things. Apart from any other appliances, look for the star ratings. It's usually more cost effective to spend a little bit more on an appliance and then have low running costs. And that's one thing that renders can do if you're buying a fridge or um, I mean, the fridge is probably the main one for a non-fixed appliance that uses a lot of energy. TVs as well, you know, more efficient usually saves you money. Um, old fridges might work fine, but they often cost a lot to run. And I replaced my perfectly fine old fridge with a new fridge about 10 years ago because I discovered my old fridge was costing me hundreds and hundreds of dollars a year to run compared to a new fridge. They recycled the old one. I got a more efficient fridge. It actually works better, keeps my food colder, doesn't build up ice. It's a win-win. So it's really worth considering if you're getting um, new appliances. And look, a couple of Useful resources here, um, the Victorian Energy Upgrades Program, which gives discounts on a whole lot of energy efficient products. You've probably encountered lots of people who go door to door trying to sell, um, trying to sell draft stoppers and or trying to give for free draft stopping and light globes and shower, high, you know, efficient showers. But there's lots of other stuff in the scheme that give you rebates on upgrading your efficiency. I mentioned the Residential Efficiently Efficiency Scorecard. It's discounted through that scheme. Uh, I mentioned the Energy Bill Comparison Service. Sustainability Victoria has information about going all electric, uh, if you're interested in that, and lots of other information about efficiency and about different appliances and, you know, window treatments and insulation and stuff. The Your Home website I mentioned has heaps of information. Renew has a getting off gas toolkit and also heating and cooling buyer's guide. So they're useful if you're looking at what you can do and like appliances, if you're shopping for an appliance. Um, and of course, there's a solar homes program in Victoria that not only gives you rebates on solar panels, but also on hot water systems and other stuff. So they're all good to check out. Um, and that's it for my presentation. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, and let's uh, go to the Q&A now. Thanks, Dean. That was great. Um, I, it reminds me of a, a time just before I had my first child and we had big big glass windows at the back um, of my house and it was so hot that it used to melt. I had a pillar candle about yay high yeah. and about as thick. And after one hot day, the pillar candle actually melted off the mantle. And um, I ordered some external awnings. They were about a 90% trend, um, 90% block out. So it meant yep. I could still see outside, um, you know, the shadows of the trees and things, but I, it meant that, um, I didn't feel like I was in the cold, you know, in the dark house, like Nana used to have it, used to have all yeah. everything all, all closed up. Um, and I ordered the evaporative cooling unit at the same time. And it took about eight weeks to come, but the, the external awnings turned up the week before the cooler came. Yeah. And after the external awnings came in, I was like, Oh, I've wasted $4,000 on an evaporative cooler. I don't need them. Oh, no. I don't need it. It was such a dramatic difference having just blocking out that direct sunlight um that yep. even today i did that yeah 15 years ago it was amazing yeah no that is pretty in incredible and it reminds me of someone i spoke to who installed hydronic heating in their home and then they put in some reverse cycle air conditioners and they were like we don't need to use hydronic heating they upped their yeah. insulation it was like insulation air conditioning reverse cycle air conditioners that was enough goodbye yeah. twelve thousand yeah, dollars in that case so you're doing well <laughs> you, you live and you learn don't you yeah. and um you create a bit of a, a summer hot day pattern you know where you walk around your house you shut everything down you pull the couple of blinds down make sure the dog ball is yeah. out of the direct sun and then at the end of the night we're lucky in melbourne we get cool changes of 
you know, we're not in Singapore where it's 31 degrees 24 seven. So it's nice to get that cool breeze when it comes and yep. open everything up. So it's funny how we get to those, into those habits. Yeah, totally. Anyway, let's get on to the Q and A. And I think, um, Ronnie, if you, uh, Ronnie asked if there was any tips on choosing an assessor, um, for an existing home, um, for home energy efficiency. And I think that top resource that you had, um, you know, around the, uh, sorry, the scorecard, the home energy, um, yeah, scorecard. I, so in that resource. Yeah. That, on the Vic, if, if you look up the Victorian energy upgrades program on the internet, you'll find like links to where you can find who's accredited to be the assessor. You have to be accredited to do the yes. residential efficiency scorecard because you use their software and they keep records because one of the aims of the program is to actually help gather information on you know the issues mm. in homes generally to guide policy um yeah look as, in terms of choosing one like you know like anything um if you can find recommendations one good resource which i haven't put up there is that if, if you use facebook there's a facebook group called my efficient electric mm. home and that's a huge resource for a lot of this stuff. You can, people ask questions to recommend assessors, solar installers, uh, experiences with different apply, brands of appliances. It's a really good resource for that. It's a Facebook group. It's got, you know, 20,000 people in it. You've got to. Mm. You know. I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Yeah. yeah so I think if you group. look it up and it says M-E-E-H, if you're looking up the group, you'll recognize it pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, and you know yeah, you got to you got to make sure that you know worker who told who look at a range of answers because there are some people yeah. who don't know what they're talking about but most people do and like one of the administrators that I think a few of the administrators of that group and quite a few members are also residential efficiency scorecard um, assessors. The guy who did my house in my rental house a few years ago was one of the admins of that group. So yeah, that right. is a good source to get it. Excellent, thanks. Um, we talked about. Um, that thermal mass properties of external walls. But what about um, the heat loss or gain through um, having your home on a concrete slab? So, you know, when you compare it to having a home on stumps with floorboards, obviously that's an airflow concern and you want to make sure you address address that. Um, but what about if you're on a on a concrete slab? Yeah, look, it sort of depends a bit. Like, like the ground takes a long time to heat up over summer. So there's there's that. And modern slabs will be sort of insulated from the ground as well. Older ones might not be. Um, but in the end, it depends a lot on like, is that slab exposed to the outside or is it just under the house or is it exposed? Like, does the slab continue out the back to form like a veranda or something and the sun hits that? That'll heat up the slab. Now, yeah, again, the, proper across, way to, yeah. the proper way to do this is to have a thermal break between the outside part and the inside part. But um, old ones it's might already built yeah so yeah so but i mean and they can both grow like a, some a concrete floor can be cool underfoot as well so that can be helpful um and you're right a elevated house can have a you know breeze blown underneath it and maybe little gaps come up through the floor and that can be cooling but it can also be hot if it's really hot air outside so it can go either way so, so some is tricky like that actually in that it depends on the temperature of the air and how fast it's moving so, but the biggest tip with concrete slabs is, I think, yeah, to protect them from getting direct sun on them if you can. That could mean even just like, you know, growing plants all around the outside of the house. Um, yeah, if you're building, typical, I think. If you're building, look at the thermal break options and, you know, there's a certain degree that's required by the building code and there's probably extra more thermal protection you can go to that's beyond the code requirements if you pay more um you know try and find out some information about the bang for buck of doing that you know i don't know i haven't done the math that might be worth spending a bit more on extra thermal stuff to you know when you build it to then reduce the effect when you're living in it but yeah I, i'm not saying there is you need to do the maths on what it's going to cost and how much more effective it's going to be yeah yeah agreed um kerry asked and i i think this is an idea for a lot of new houses where they've started to put the um the Z tracks uh, up along the up along the wall. So this is the curtains where the top of the curtain is pretty much on the ceiling, oh, yeah. um, and they're floor to ceiling curtains. Um, more often shears than actual curtains, but if they were curtains, um, we could assume that that would be just as effective as having a pelmet if there's not enough space for airflow. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The the, the pelmet thing is really can air come out 
come between the window and the curtain up the top and into the room if they're hanging from the ceiling they can't so that's exactly right yeah, yeah. great um and Jacinda was talking about ceiling fans having that summer and winter switch and you address that um but I guess it really depends on the kind of fan that you've got as to whether or not it has one often that's a step ladder and a good pier around the the top edge of the the fan yeah, it, looking for it, a little toggle it does a lot of them have a switch on the actual fan itself um some of them have a switch on the wall plate that controls them I think the more modern ones are more likely to have that but yeah find yeah. out um and I always forget which one's clockwise or anti-clockwise. I know it's the counterintuitive one. It's like for heating, you blow it. I think it depends on which way the air blades are too. So well, yeah, that, that's, that's right. I think that's things can, but I, I think the the, system, the way it works, which makes no sense to me, but it is a way. In in winter, you want it to suck the air up from the bottom, which seems counterintuitive, sucking the cold air up from the floor to the hot, but it makes the hot air at the top wash down around the walls and come back. Gotcha. And in yeah. summer, you're pushing it down and you think that that will push hot air down, but it actually just makes a draft and then scoots the hot air around and up the side. So, yeah, so yeah it's, I, I looked it up. I would I was, have done it the other way. Together, so, yeah, like, I'm glad you said that. Seemed completely counterintuitive. But if you Google it, you can find the answer. And I yeah. I did have the explanation one of the slides there, the way it works. Um, they're, yeah. they're most useful when they say winter and summer on the yeah, set. Yeah, S&W. <laughs> then it's yeah. like the machine knows. Yep, yeah, don't mess with it. Um. Jason's just saying that he's got a couple of um, return uh, reverse cycle air conditioning, but they don't quite reach the master bedroom. So he'd been looking at one of those Evapolar or Evapolar or however you want to say that, Brent. Um, okay. One of the personal evaporative coolers just for the bed, just for the master bedroom. Um, do you think that's worth it? I mean, at what um, relative humidity are they ineffective here in Melbourne? Yeah, okay. Well, I guess I don't have that level of technical know-how on the particular humidity. They, I, I know that they get less effective when it gets more humid. I'm, I'm not sure what the point is. You could probably find that by searching the internet for information on them. Look, they, they do work. You know, if your humidity is not too high, they can work fine. Um, the evaporative, you know, like I said, all the portable reverse cycle ones. Uh, I think the evaporative ones are probably a bit quieter. Um, and that's, you know, and that's. That's one option. Like the other option is that, you know, how big is your house? How well is it insulated? Um, because, you know, if the house is well insulated and it's not too big and it's got enough, then the air will sort of equalize through the house. And that may or may not be enough because we all have different levels of coolness or warmth that we want as well. So, yeah. Um, the thing with evaporative, you know, they do work pretty well. They're relatively cheap to run, but they do sort of top out when it starts to get more humid and, yeah, look, I'm, I'm not exactly yeah. sure on the level, but I think you can probably find that information if you search for it. We Sorry. bought we bought one of those small white box ones yep. from Bunnings for the inside of our caravan because we have a six berth caravan and it gets quite hot um, in some of the places that we travel. Yep. And we used to just keep the ice bricks um, to put in the cool water reserve so oh, that yeah. that water was quite cool. And they, yeah, they they worked. It worked pretty well for this short time it took to kind of fall asleep, you know, yeah. that first few hours and they have timers and things so they can turn off. So yeah, which I is think... a good thing for cooling stuff like that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So as long as you're not trying to heat a massive um, space, I think it would probably be okay. Um, and that's always one of the things I, like, to what extent are we trying to cool the whole space versus cool the people in the space? That that's, yeah. that's, that's often the question. And sometimes one is appropriate more than others. Like often I find in the in-between sort of seasons when we just have a hot day here or there, like a fan that just cools me when I'm sitting at my desk is enough. Whereas in the real hot part, yeah, that's when we want the whole house to be cool. Yeah. Our youngest son has a little desk fan that sits on his bedside table that basically blows on his head yep. you know, um, <laughs> on the hot nights. So yep. yeah, it's all about ta tailoring it to what yep. your space and Absolutely. your personal comfort needs. Yeah. Totally. Um, a couple of last questions. Um, Wendy was asking about whether or not you can still get the LEDs through the government scheme, you know, free or dis, um, discounted. And I think you covered that in that resource slide about um, going to the energy efficiency upgrades, um, the government site. Yeah, ab absolutely. And look, I had someone at my door like just a month ago with LED globes and I've already got them everywhere. So that it is still going. I do know that the government's looking at changing that scheme because there's been a bit of like poor quality appliances done through it and there's been a bit of like poor customer service sort of stuff as well so that might get a little that that might 
remove like increase some barriers i think it, i think the effect might be to reduce or stop the door-to-door -door sort of thing yeah. um which you know is convenient but can is also often a source of really bad selling practices um yeah. you know i did hear one place that was giving old globes to people and stuff like this so there's a few dodgy operators out there so going through the veu victorian energy upgrades website is a good yeah. way to find one and look you really recommendations from it like a site like my fish living home you can find a company that does it and that's their specialty and they, they also can access the rebate um that's might be a good way to do it if you really want to make sure you got the yeah. good ones. Like, like one thing i know i found from the from the um door door one is like yeah they came and they gave me all these glows but they were all the same brightness and in the end i went to the store and bought some that were less brightness and some that were more brightness because i like different yeah you know i don't want to you know really bright globe in my bedside light you know so i bought a yeah <laughs> a less bright one yeah. so, well they didn't really offer me that choice and the, and the temperature like do you want it to be a warm light or a cool light exactly so you don't yeah. you know whilst you might want um a cool light in the kitchen you want that warm um so that more yellow just yellow um yeah. in your living space or your bedrooms and i noticed my place sort of looked like a dentist's office um for a little bit after the upgrade and then yeah we changed a couple over but i found no. word of mouth is a really powerful tool yeah um, and i reckon this is where if you stores. like if you proactively find a you know company that does Victorian energy upgrades and approach them and say, I want to do my house and I want this many of that and I want this many of that, you're probably more likely to get that. And you might not, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't done it. Maybe you won't get them all for free because it's a bit more bespoke, but you know, you'll still get the benefit because they still the rebate still applies. You know, I think one way that one way that the door to door people do it all for free is that, you know, they they don't have that variety. They go one model a uh, bunch of backpackers you know they keep their costs down low by doing that sort of yeah reducing their own pick out a sort of service yeah have you seen the evaporative cooler um covers that they also offer for free now so they're like a um, perspex square cover that goes up on your evaporative cooler vents, uh, vents, in, vents. on the ceiling yeah and they just and they just attach with a little bit of elastic and it means over um during winter so once you've finished with your aircon you can yes. put them up they're temporary they don't look that ugly i mean once you stop looking at your ceiling you they don't probably look better them. than a piece of cardboard which is what a lot of people do <laughs> yeah and yeah, yeah. that's the thing because in, in winter they're a big source of heat loss is evaporative cooling vents so you do need to block them off and and the other one that i, I actually found really useful and again this was a guy who came door to door and it was free uh automatically operated exhaust fan covers again probably more effective in winter than summer because you do lose a lot of heat you lose a lot of heat you lose a lot of heat through your exhaust fans just because they're a hole into your ceiling they're not insulated yeah. these covers go behind the the fan inside the ceiling they've got little flaps and they're just yep. operated by the air pressure when the fan goes off the flaps open yeah and, they're like a baffle yeah like a baffle that automatically yeah. opens when you run the fan and then when you turn the fan off they go whoop and they close out again um yeah. i got them in my three exhaust fans in my house they work great yeah i think is it draft stopper is the brand of that it's I think, F -T -O -P -P -A. I think that's it uh, there might be a couple but yeah i think that is one of the brands and like i i knew about them i'd never got around to looking for them but i yeah had some guy came and go for free and under that scheme and that was fine it was a good outcome i thought yeah yeah um that's the end of our questions dean thank you again as always for giving us lots of insight into all of the different elements. It's a lot to kind of cover in one session. And um, and I think you did that really well today. So thank you. And Great. Thank you. Thank you. Renew has lots of um, further information and different links. And the Renew website's really fabulous. So for um, those people that want to do a deeper dive into any one of those elements, yeah, really. um, they can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, enjoy the rest of your Saturday afternoon, everybody. Um, well, it's still morning. That's the benefit of starting <laughs> these at 10 a.m. <laughs> it is um, the best benefit. <laughs> but, enjoy the, but enjoy the rest of your Saturday, Dean. And um, yeah. Thank you. We'll you talk too. again for the next one. For sure.